We are a challenger stockbroker. Giving the access to our users and really guiding them through. Trying to make investing accessible to everyone. Today I'm joined by Yanni Kielunen and we're going to be talking about the UK investment platform Free Trade, where he is a senior product manager. So basically we're a challenger stockbroker um, that basically charges no commissions and gives you uh, an app to invest into the stock market. Very similar to um, Robinhood from the US and trying to bring that to the UK and larger Europe. Yeah. Um, basically trying to make investing accessible to everyone. You can invest into your regular Tesla, Apple, Amazon, but at the same time you have uh, uh, ETFs which basically diversify your portfolio so that you can actually invest into larger markets like S&P 500 mm -hmm. and FTSE and all of those so that you can basically uh, do pretty much anything that you could do on a, any other um, investment platform and we're trying to make that simpler. Free trades, basic buy and sell trades are all sort of bunched together and executed for free at around 4 p.m. on a working day, hence the name. So it's great for someone like me who's sort of not bothered about the price or the timing of the market and the passive investor because of conventional brokers actively trading too much adds a few extra costs. At the minute, um, the choice of investments is not what you've got available with some of the larger brokers, but they've got pretty much all of the FTSE 100 available, as you mentioned, and the 250, many ETFs and so on. I guess Gen Y is the, the demographics, anyone else you're going for? And how did you sort of go about validating that this was the market you wanted to get into? Sure, so basically 80% um, of our user base is uh, millennials trying to find an easy to use platform where you don't have to pay insane fees. Basically we validated the, the demographic largely with our waitlist, start getting that validation pinging our uh, European users, kind of the, the journeys that already exist in the UK and seeing what we need to change and what works now. You mentioned you're trying to expand and grow and that kind of thing, but how, as it stands, what are the, what's the make of the product teams? We're about uh, 40 people, have one single cross-functional team initially, yep. and now we've started to understand our kind of where the business needs to focus, where the product needs to focus, and we're in three different verticals, mm -hmm. we split it. So Discover and Insights, which is what I'm leading at the moment, and then Growth is another one, like you mentioned, where um, growth is a big part of it, and we're really trying to grow quickly and mm -hmm. trying to get those users on board. Uh, with the wait list and, and other tools. And then the third one being um, invest vertical, which is basically everything behind the scenes. How do we actually deal with the, the stock trading? How do we make that available? And, and really trying to give those tools to um, future products like fractional shares so that you don't have to have 1,500 to put into Amazon, for mm -hmm. example, but trying to make that accessible as well. You've got a beautiful app, super slick. Um, it works very functionally yeah. uh, and is designed to, to achieve that goal, I guess. We work really closely with uh, engineering design. So the problem solving initially and the kickoffs always have someone from business, product, um, design, and engineering involved. So trying to get that mutual buy-in and also the ideas across. We think that as a whole, we can tackle the problems in a better way than just have someone dictate what we should build and what we shouldn't. We always have our test users and and ad hoc users that we can kind of get qualitative feedback before the full rollout. I was interested if there was anything, any sort of third parties that you had to utilize and that kind of thing. There's a lot that we're building in-house and that's also why we have the invest vertical. Yeah. But there are obviously um, access to the market, so uh, to the market makers. And there are certain things that we have to do in order to actually execute the trades. Yeah. But also from a perspective of onboarding. So for example, know your customers. So KYC process, um, there are companies equipped with that information and obviously uh, for some of the messaging tools it doesn't make sense for us to build in-house at this moment in time yeah. but we can utilize a third party uh, because it gives us more depth and yeah. better analytics. What benefit do you get from like publishing your roadmap? It helps us prioritize what we should focus on and what we shouldn't in terms of uh, customer output. I guess you're just talking about more top-level jobs there rather than some of the smaller things that exactly. you get involved with. So it's a lot of top-level especially the further out you go. Yeah. Uh, we try to keep the kind of what we're working on now more specific, but at the same time, we try to deliver quickly and some value to the user and our end users. And yeah. I actually posted a blog post about what we're focusing on, trying to give a little bit more depth to it because essentially we're giving a view of a Kanban board, which only if you have some of the 
core pieces together or really follow free trade, it's easier to understand what we're trying to build and why. It can be sometimes difficult to manage expectations, but we try to be sure. as transparent as we can. All right, cool. So uh, without further ado, let's take a look at the app. Um, this first journey we're going to be taking a look at is the onboarding flow. Started off with the passcode and then the option to log in via Face ID. Um, and then we'll go in with first name and surname. So clicking continue, the call to action becomes available and then we're going to enter the birthday from this little sort of scroll at the bottom, entering in the postcode. Few choice bits of, of text um, above, uh, just below the title there, so we can see what's being asked and why. Uh, and kind of playful language there as well, which is quite interesting. Um, we're scrolling through a list of addresses there, selecting the nationality. As we're saying here, part of the KYC process involved requires for companies like Free Trade to request certain bits of information from their users. Um, but always kept playful as we can see here with the like American flag emoji in there uh, and a little bit of um, Free Trade Olympics there as well. So there we've got the sort of types of account we want to get involved with. In this instance we've got an ISA or we've got the standard account. A declaration form here, so just bits of information in terms and conditions and so on, which we'll use the checkbox for. And then the basic account is used here. So now we're creating the account. We've got that loading screen and we did jump over a little bit while you were completing the checks. Nice little holding image there. Go and grab yourself a cup of tea. And then here we're deposited onto the landing page and we're greeted instantly via um, Gemma from Free Trade in this instance, um, who's given us some nice tips about how we can navigate through the app. Um, so yeah, really nice uh, integration built into the chat format there. How do you keep it so short? What we really try to do here is make it as simple as signing up to any social media app or any kind of app that you would currently be using on a day-to-day -day basis. So trying to make that as simple as possible because obviously we need to um, get certain information out uh, while still making it kind of playful and hence the tone of voice. We're trying to make it as simple as possible, but obviously um, we need some of the core information. And how did this work out for you in the in the waiting list scenario? It's something that we're constantly working on and trying to evolve because obviously there's um, our initial users were very excited about getting into free trade and, and already being a part of the community and, yeah. and having that kind of know-how and what we're actually trying to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas now what we're realizing is that there are people who are hearing about us but don't really know. So. We're trying to make that a simpler process so that you can actually get a little bit of a touch and feel on how right. um, and what we're actually doing. Um, and like yeah. you mentioned, that there are certain uh, certain pieces of information that we need to get, and mm -hmm. then you don't have to submit documentation, but that also we do utilize a third-party tool like um, okay. we talked about earlier so that we can actually make those checks as painless as possible yeah, yeah. Um, because there are credit scores and, and all that kind of information that goes through the background. but. Sure. Um, at the same time, if you've moved here in the past couple of months and and there isn't enough information about you in the UK, then you might have to go uh, and scan a kind of a documentation. Yeah. Um, just an interesting point there in the videos where like we were waiting for the loading screen, so they were obviously doing the checks. Yeah. And then you put that little holding screen up for the like the mug. Yeah. Making the user anticipate the fact that they've got to wait for a thing. Exactly. So okay. managing expectations is a big part, and there are certain um, levels of of waiting periods that we kind of go through and when it takes a little bit longer we know that it might actually take you know that five minutes extra rather than staring at the screen we yeah. try to prompt you to you know grab a coffee or a tea uh, yeah. and, and try to be a little bit playful with that because sometimes uh, it can be more painful to actually just stare at that screen and then jumping straight off from that point the user's got their account their, their account's open they've got this big pop-up screen put in front of them that seems like a really important interaction for you guys, like the first point of contact with the product. Yeah. So you, how, how do you go about deciding what goes in there, what to, what to prepare in that regard? One of the first parts is that the message that we're, we've integrated so far is so that we can actually add value straight from the beginning. So trying to kind of give that um, like a human feel to it so that sure. you can actually talk to someone. And we do use Intercom for that so that you can actually ping Gemma um, and have a chat if you have some questions, yeah. you maybe don't know what exactly you're looking at or 
how something works. So we have someone from our side to actually guide you through. How do you go about like gathering the feedback on that? Obviously, it's an important part of your process. Yeah. It must be sort of systematized and that kind of thing. You'll take insights into, I guess, a document or whatever, mm -hmm. and then sort of work through those, identify sentiment, that kind of thing. Basically, Intercom as a tool gives us um, these tagging possibilities so yeah. that we can actually tag and prioritize what comes through and actually push into Jira if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, or then just feedback into, okay, well, this is what's expected. and. Um, or some people don't understand this feature or something that we're trying to convey. Um, and we always try to push that straight into development depending on what it is, if it's a bug or, or an yeah. issue. And then we do collect all of the feedback into a doc and then it goes um, into helping prioritize what to build next or how yeah. to iterate that product. Yeah. So here is an overview of the discover area. And we've got these tags, which you've mentioned oh. before, which we can then use to sort of uh, filter the search terms in order to get relevant information for us. So there's the stock area um, highlighted at the top. We'll use the search bar to find relevant stocks for us. In this instance, it's Spotify. Um, and then we'll buy using that big call to action, enter the amount that we'd like to purchase. How did you discover which types of filters you wanted to apply for these users and what sort of, um, what sort of things helped you to come to that conclusion? Like I mentioned before, we tried to add really quick value to our users and, and yeah. try to iterate as quickly as possible. So adding those four um, made sense to us at the beginning because our universe is still somewhat limited in terms of stocks. And what we saw is that uh, a lot of the search terms that we get on, on our search bar yeah. before we launched were related to either um, instrument type or or um, then the country specifically. So trying to use that data that we actually have to make decisions and then also trying to really um, have uh, as little as possible uh, development power into actually proving a concept that we, we believe will work. And that's why we started with these simple um, little pills at the top that you can click, yep. or the tags uh, that you can click and filter by, and then pushing that out and trying to open a community post on kind of what their feedback is, oh, cool. how yeah. do they actually interact with it, what makes sense, what doesn't, and um, we get a lot of feedback, and obviously there are certain things that we need to decide on mm -hmm. before we ship and try to get that um, interaction from our users. I guess that sort of plays into like the copycat type uh, thing as well. People like being able to maybe see what other people have invested in and yeah. things like that. So uh, I remember one time we were looking at, I think it may have been um, something like Stash over in the States or whatever, and they there was a, a certain asset uh, type which was like Berkshire Hathaway so you can directly copy what Warren Buffet is doing. That must be really important for like helping customers to get like a sense of confidence in what they're doing and super important for you guys to like make these groupings super easy for people to understand and things like that right? Exactly and we we also want to make sure that uh, they're well educated in the pieces that we're actually uh, pushing yeah. out so not just say these are the top traded because that just means that a lot of people have traded and maybe it's popular, but mm -hmm. that doesn't make maybe sense for some users who are really trying to not risk their savings into investments. But that's why we're also working on some educational pieces to understand what index ETFs are and how to diversify your portfolio. So yeah. we're really trying to be cautious on giving the access to our users and really guiding them through. Yeah. Um, but while still educating them on how to be savvy uh, in investing and where to get kind of get started especially for those younger investors who are looking to start investing and aren't really versed in it yet yeah. but really want to get to know what to do so we're trying to build those kind of features alongside with um, filtering options and, and collections what point you want to introduce like positive friction and like are you sure you want to do that kind of thing on where you just want to make it super easy and super simple is there yeah. any ever any thinking like that so yeah, there, there's definitely those kind of, so that you don't put money into something that you didn't mean to. Yeah. But that's also why we have a verification on, on the passcode or, or facial recognition or your uh, fingerprint, yeah. Yeah. so that you actually do verify that you're, you want to spend that money on investing or trading. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so we do have those so-called friction points, but at the same time, we wanted to take that kind of barrier to entry out from if you go with your traditional bank and try to invest in something, it seems like a bunch of jargon and you don't really understand where you're going and getting yeah. started. Whereas we really wanted to make it as simple as this is what you're going to get for, for how much you're putting in. And 
this is what it means for you as a, as a user, for example, if you're buying Apple shares. But is there any other aspect of the sort of discovery area which you're kind of really proud of? What's coming in the next kind of month or so, it's yeah. going to be really exciting. We'll be testing already the collections very soon, yep. so next week or the week after. Um, and then we'll be building more UI elements and making that interaction even easier. So we've got this sort of profile area, and as you may have heard me parroting on earlier, there is an FAQs bit here, which has got this sort of uh, neat, there's an instant difference here in the sort of the use of color and things like that, um, which makes you think that maybe this isn't something they've built internally. We've got a search function available, which can allow you to sort of dynamically uh, access copy with highlighted bits of text relevant to you. And then floating through to the live chat area, we've got this sort of um, human interaction. So we're very clear on the fact that there's intercom integrations here using that because why not? It's a really good service. It's super well developed. So the live chat's a great way to actually approach certain things and, and message our users yeah. uh, proactively or then reactively depending on what kind of um, topics we're, we're uncovering. Yeah, and yeah. then also the FAQ is really important because um, Maybe you want to start investing, but you don't know exactly where or uh, how does a deposit work, for example, or, or why something's taking a little bit longer. And we really want to guide you and, and help our users rather than make it kind of self-discovery, but really try to help you through rather than be yeah. a painful process. How do you decide what to write and when to write it, that kind of thing? Understanding those pain points initially really helped kind of prioritize what to write and what yeah. content we should have. And then as we ship features or iterate on certain products or, or what's already out there, um, that also gives us kind of the priority um, at the moment so that we can fulfill something that keeps on coming or trending themes that are being asked and, and um, yeah. really try to be proactive about it. So for example, when we launched ISAs, we wanted to have a piece on uh, what that actually means and what does it mean that you don't have to pay taxes on certain things and, and what an ISA wrapper actually means um, for a user and, and why would you, uh, for example, pay a little bit extra for that uh, versus a basic account and kind of understanding that and giving that out uh, yeah. for our users. Okay, awesome. And um, you were talking then a little earlier about like the intercom being a way of communicating with users and then I guess there's a two-way street there. You know, you mm -hmm. can have... Um, system errors or maybe yeah. bugs can be message defined it that being the main channel for these things coming through is there any other way that that happens i guess the community being one right our community being one and also uh, twitter so we have twitter, okay. a lot of people coming on on twitter and we always try to be very proactive um across the entire company so it doesn't even have to be just um our customer ops or or marketing but for example, sometimes I jump on uh, to some certain comments that come up regarding features or a roadmap or what we're building. So yeah. everyone's really involved in that in that process. Uh, Why not sort of filter this stuff out with a chat bot? I guess maybe it's to do with the size of, of, of maybe you may need to at some point sort of um, sort of make use of one of those things in order to silo things to certain departments or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I guess super important for you to have that personal touch or what's going on there? Yeah, I think that personal touch is especially important for such an early stage um, or growing company, let's yep. say, because there are a lot of users who expect that instant instant feedback and we want to make it as painless as possible. And we think customer customer support and customer operations is very important to, to really helping our users and, yeah. and making sure that they know that they're heard and, and that we're working on features and, and fixing bugs. So whenever there is a bug that's being raised, we always get back to our users and say, okay, now it's fixed. So take a look, hopefully, um, if anything else comes up, um, let us know, but hopefully everything's great now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of giving that two-way communication and, and building that trust, having that like human element of it and, and that personal touch is really important for mm -hmm. us. And uh, we really value our, our users and everything that we build and do. So trying to really get that across. Yeah. Um, and that's why we really focused on, on getting that out there versus then some um, older applications or, or websites where you can do the same thing, but you never have that kind of personal touch or interaction yeah. with anyone. And do you anticipate that changing at all as you scale? Of course, like once we once we hit um, larger numbers and and it becomes uh, more uh, or it takes more time uh, from our side, uh, we're currently scaling the team. But at the same time, we are looking at at ways of how to assess uh, prioritization and and also because like I mentioned, there are people who are like, oh, great job, thanks for for adding that. Uh, how do we actually 
like get back to that, but maybe it's not as urgent as someone who would be having a life uh, issue right now. So trying to kind of um, automate those sides of, uh, of communication and, and building that out. But it's definitely something we're working on, but uh, we still want to have that human touch and human element in, in sure. our uh, communications. Awesome. Um, well, that's all the time we've got for today. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. If you want to see more of 11FS Pulse, head over to pulse.11fs.com. And if you've got any questions about the product or want to suggest a journey, hit us up at pulse at 11fs.com or find us on Twitter at pulse 11fs pulse. Uh, Yanni, if anyone wants to find you on Twitter or anything like that, where should they go? Uh, at Yanni Kilunen. So my name's a little <laughs> difficult, but uh... we'll type that in. We'll type that one in the show notes. Um, uh, yeah. So if you want to hear more from us next week, we're going to be talking a little bit about credit and how that's going to work. So we'll see you next time. Home Screen is a show about all things product and design, where we showcase some of the best examples of user experiences from the 11FS Pulse research platform. If you don't already know what that is, it's our benchmarking tool here at 11FS, which includes over two and a half thousand user journeys from financial service products around the world. 